from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome uh, to the uh, third and final program in the Native American Heritage Month programs here at the Library of Congress. I'm Guha Shankar uh, from the American Folklife Center. I've been working with colleagues uh, in the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity, Roberto Salazar, uh, also Eric Eldridge, uh, Carla Davis Castro from the Law Library, uh, Jennifer in the back from CRS, uh, in order to do a series of programs here at uh, uh, the library for, these, uh, for this month. Um, it's going, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Gabriela Perez Baez, uh, the Curator of Linguistics in the uh, Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, I won't, uh, obviously, if I were to sit here and read out all of her accomplishments, that would take up half the time, so I'm going to keep it brief and just uh, let you know that uh, uh, Gabriela Perez Baez has conducted research on Zapotec languages since 2002. She's devoted much of her work to studying factors of language maintenance and endangerment with a focus on the impact of migration uh, in the community of diasporic speakers of uh, uh, San Lucas uh, Kivani Zapotec and the influences on its sort of sister uh, mirror community in Los Angeles. Uh, for, uh, importantly, for the uh, Library of Congress. Uh, Gabriela is the co-PI of the Breath of Life Language Institutes, about which she'll be t speaking about today. And it's important for the library because uh, the Library of Congress, and, uh, principally the American Folklife Center, but also colleagues in uh, the Manuscripts Division, represented by Barbara Baer and Julie Miller, along with colleagues uh, in the Geography and Maps Division, uh, as well as the Prints and Photographs Division, host uh, some of these community members who come and do research in the National Library collections as part of their own programs of linguistic maintenance, cultural revitalization, uh, and other uh, purposes for which they use the collections here at the library. So it's been a very fruitful collaboration for the last few years, and Gabriel will talk about that as well. Um, and speaking of collaborations, uh, uh, one of our other uh, principals in this enterprise is Judith Gray, head of reference at the American Folklife Center, who's trying to walk in the door. I'm not sure what she's doing. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Come on in, Judith. Um, so uh, apropos of that, uh, I will now uh, turn it over to Gabriela. Um, we will have about probably 25 minutes of the presentation, and then we'll have 30. Who's keeping count? And that will mean there'll be ample room for questions and answers at the end. And uh, please uh, make sure that you uh, do ask questions. This is an interactive session. We uh, appreciate all of you coming uh, on your lunch hour. And uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Gabriela Perez Baez. Thank you very much for. Uh, that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I was just telling Guha that despite the fact that we've been collaborating for so long, because I'm always trying to get things running at Breath of, uh, for Breath of Life at the Museum of Natural History, I don't get to be here. So this is a real uh, treat. So um, I'm currently serving as Director of Recovering Voices. Uh, it's the initiative I want to talk to you um, about and within that context I will talk specifically about um, programmatic activities like uh, Breath of Life and how they fit into our model. So uh, Recovering Voices is a priority interdisciplinary initiative of the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian. Um, it's intended to respond to the global loss of linguistic diversity, uh, and not only that, it also focuses heavily on the loss of knowledge that is associated with um, the loss of linguistic diversity. Um, the idea is to conduct and enable research on languages and knowledge systems to understand the loss of cultural diversity and develop effective responses uh, to reverse it. Um, access to collections is central to the recovery and generation of knowledge in the process. Global impact is uh, achieved through partnerships um, with communities, with academic institutions. Um, we favor an interdisciplinary approach in recognition of the holistic approaches to knowledge uh, that indigenous communities have. Um, this initiative, Recovering Voices, originated um, at within the anthropology department at the National Museum of Natural History, uh, but it works with partners um, in this, across the Smithsonian um, 
you know, partner units across the, the Smithsonian, as well as Southside. And again, uh, a focus of today's talk will be the partnership that we have with the Library of Congress. Um, what distinctive competen competence do we offer? Why should the Smithsonian get involved in uh, trying to address the issue of language endangerment? Well, it's our collections. That's why collections-based research is such a strong focus of recovering voices. Um, we hold 9,000 linear feet of manuscripts, which have been told equals five times the height of the Washington Monument. Generally, when I make this analogy outside Washington, nobody knows what it means, but you guys know. Um, we also have 144.5, I was told, million items in our collections that uh, cover the spectrum of the seven disciplines uh, at the National Museum of Natural History. So there's anthropology, uh, mineral sciences, um, zoology, etc., botany. Um, so the focus, in very simple terms, is to use these collections as stimuli to generate or regenerate knowledge um, and help uh, revitalize languages. Um, there's three of us, uh, three curators from the National Museum of Natural History behind this uh, initiative. Uh, myself serving currently as director for another couple more weeks. And then um, my colleague Gwen Isaac, who you see at the front of this uh, photo, will be taking over. Um, she, uh, along with Joshua Bell and myself, have been the three curators behind the initiative. Um, and we have two program assistants, and we have fellow interns, contractors, depending on what activity, what projects, special projects we have. Uh, we have collaborators across the disciplines in the museum. Uh, again, uh, collaborators across the Smithsonian Institution, notably the National Museum of the American Indian and the Center for Folk Life and, uh, and Cultural Heritage. And we have a network of partners, um, starting with the Library of Congress, but also uh, the Miamia Center, who's a critical partner in Breath of Life, the UNESCO University of Hawaii, and so on. So let's talk about the Recovering Voices model. Um, so again, collections are central, and our focus is to mobilize these collections to foster community-based research for language and knowledge revitalization. And by community-based research, what we mean is community-driven or community-directed or um, research that is uh, for community benefit and that is designed in, collabor in cl cl close cl collaboration with a, a community. The model works for collections-based research both in the museum setting and in the field, and I will talk about the two uh, settings and how that works. Our research priorities are three. Uh, we, have, we run a community research program, uh, which I'll talk about, the National Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages, which for short, we'll, I'll refer to it as Breath of Life, and uh, field research. Um, so let's start with the community research program. Um, the Recovering Voices has an operating fund that allows us to um, fund visits by community researchers, three, three different visits per year, to come and carry out um, research on our collections that is designed by the researchers. These researchers don't need to be affiliated with an academic institution, and they do not need to have an academic background, provided they are involved in their communities' uh, activities to revitalize culture, language, knowledge, and are able to articulate a project that um, it, uh, around a particularly robust collection uh, of any kind in our museum, um, we're able to fund. Uh, right now, we're in the process of finalizing the selection of the uh, community research visits for 2017. So it's an annual competitive process. Uh, we don't get a ton of applications, but we do get about a dozen, which is probably enough because we're able to fund three, and that way we're able to fund a higher percentage of the uh, applications. The idea is that we have $10,000 that we're able to put towards covering the travel expenses, lodging, et cetera, of these visits. We have um, so far funded 17 research visits since 2012. And I know you're not supposed to put you know, heavy text slides here, but I figured this would give you a sense of the breadth of uh, community research that has been conducted so far under this program. Uh, we recently, I'll mention, for example, the, the last, uh, the one at the bottom, 
um, a group of Wauja um, researchers, uh, sorry, Wauja chiefs who are also conducting research um, from the um, northern Amazon region were here um, in September. Uh, it seems like a long time uh, ago, but they were here in September. Uh, they were able to work out an arrangement with a local researcher uh, so that they could extend their visit for uh, up to a month um, because they were staying at this person's home. Uh, and so they were able to be here visiting the film archives um, at uh, the Suitland facility. But they were also, they visited the entomology collection, the birds collection, the fish collection. It was really interesting. I was just telling Guha a few minutes ago <coughs> that um, it was very revealing uh, for the collections uh, managers to be talking to people who know these species so incredibly well. One of the Wauja chiefs has actually helped collect some of the fish that are in our collections nowadays. And they were able to engage in a conversation about how climate change is impacting some of these species. So it's, it's very much a dialogue. It, this, these visits, sometimes we feel that we gain more as collections managers, as curators, from this interaction. Um, but of course, uh, the, all of these communities are walking away with uh, the ability to utilize these collections, again, as stimuli for generating uh, or regenerating knowledge. Um, now let me talk about uh, National Breath of Life. Um, so the National uh, Breath of Life is based in D.C. because of the unparalleled collections that we have here across the institutions uh, based in the region, in the city. Um, specifically, there's three partner uh, institutions, the um, National Anthropological Archives at the National Museum of Natural History, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Library of Congress. Um, we work, uh, this is uh, a program funded by the National Science Foundation, and therefore we, we partner closely with other institutions uh, outside the, the federal government system to be able to receive or use these grants. Um, so we have partnered with Yale University twice, and now we have a very strong partnership with the Miamia Center at Miami University. You might have heard from the recent MacArthur Fellowship Awards. Uh, you might have heard about Daryl Baldwin. He was the recipient of one of these awards this year for his work in reclaiming the Miamia language. This is a language that ceased to be spoken in the 40s. Um, and through the work of Daryl Baldwin in collaboration with a linguist from UC Berkeley, they were able to reconstruct the grammar phonology of the language based on archival materials, many of which are at the NAA. Um, and to make a very long 30, 40 year long story short, the community now has speakers of the language uh, that have various degrees of competence. But in, in his home, Daryl uh, and his family carry out their daily life in Miami. So they have been effectively able to reclaim the language, something which we thought was not possible even 20 years ago. Um, so it's following that model, the relevance of archival materials for languages that no longer have speakers or have very few speakers, um, or where knowledge has been eroded significantly, that uh, Breath of Life is uh, designed. And the model was actually developed based on um, a document that was produced by a group in Australia called the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island, 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 Islander Studies. Breath of Life is a program that has very long names involved in the entire, <laughs> throughout the entire process. So they, the, they had recognized that uh, archives were really valuable resources and wrote a uh, document to, to detail a model, a method for using them for revitalization. That model was taken and further developed by, and here's another long name, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Revival uh, in uh, partnership with UC Berkeley. Um, and we have been, now uh, at UC Berkeley, the focus was on California tribes only that no longer had speakers of their languages. In uh, DC, because of the breadth of the collections that are available here, we can go beyond that very uh, um, that limited um, set of participants 
to serve any communities, primarily in the U.S., but also Canada, and we might be uh, hosting someone from Mexico uh, this year, um, independently of whether they have speakers uh, of the language or not. Generally, uh, because of the uh, situation in North America, we, we host participants whose languages have very few speakers or no speakers left, but that not, that's not always the case. Um, so the point, so the, the, the um, structure of Breath of Life, uh, or the goal is to familiarize participants with the archives and provide them with the skills to be able to find materials on their languages. We teach fundamentals in linguistics uh, so that they can begin to read and interpret the materials. And anyone who's ever looked at a manuscript knows that it's not very easy. There are idiosyncrasies in the documentation, there's handwriting quirks, um, and you need to interpret what's a noun, what's a verb, et cetera. So we provide fundament, you know, basics um, in, to be able to do that. Um, and uh, we discuss and demonstrate ways, demonstrate ways that the materials can be utilized for language revitalization. And we always have people like Daryl Baldwin and uh, other people who have very similarly uh, long-standing um, projects in revitalization that come and share their experience. So there, again, there are three core elements, basic linguistics, archival research, and applied approaches. Um, during, so Breath of Life, um, unlike Berkeley and other Breath of Life models that only last a week, the National Breath of Life takes two weeks because, again, of the um, amount of materials that can be consulted uh, here. Um, during that time, uh, the participants who are selected through a competitive process as well, uh, this year we received around 70 applications and we'll be able to um, uh, host about 30 of them. Um, so every, every language group, sometimes we get one single individual, but generally we get two or three people from one language community who come and work together. And each language group will get a, an academically trained linguist assigned to work with them one-on-one -on -one throughout the two weeks. Um, <clears throat> On our end, the curators, the archivists, the librarians will teach the participants how to navigate the catalogs. Every institution has a different type of catalog, but overall the principles of uh, catalog research are uh, applicable across the board. So we try to make sure that when the participants leave, they can still come back to the um, catalog and find stuff that they might be interested in. Um, we, of course, provide access to the materials, so ahead of time we, ha we pull up everything for this language and that language, and the participants are able to work on the materials hands-on. Um, and we also produce archival quality uh, materials. We were just actually talking about um, trying to make a more concerted, concerted effort to um, inform the Library of Congress about the languages that will be represented in the next Breath of Life, which, by the way, happens May 29 to June 9th in 2017. Um, and that way, the participants can leave with archival surrogates of their materials. Um, so, Bre the, Breath of the Breath of Life national model has evolved over the last uh, few years. We're going to have, again, the, the fourth iteration in, in May uh, 2017 for two weeks. Um, to date, if you look at the number of languages every, that we've had every year, 22 was really a lot of languages. Um, 14, 15 is more or less the scope that is uh, manageable and we can attend to everyone's needs uh, more effectively and efficiently. So by now, with, or by the end of to the 2017 Institute, we will have uh, served about 70 or so um, language communities, every time providing digital surrogates, providing instruction, access to the materials. Now we're trying to evolve um, because, you know, yes, we could keep doing this um, every two years if the NSF uh, Documenting Endangered Languages program is uh, willing to continue to fund us. 
but we see a need to evolve um, in a couple of ways. First of all, we're, one thing we're doing this year is we're doing an assessment of the program to make sure that indeed participants leave knowing that uh, they can always go back to the catalogs and they know how to use them. That's something we can't easily met or haven't been able to measure uh, easily um, without a structure to do so, a person dedicated to following up and so on. So we're going to be doing that assessment of the program, not of the participants, but of our program um, this year. The other thing we are doing also based on the experience, um, the, uh, observing the experiences of these researchers is that um, we've come to the realization that we are asking these researchers to develop in two weeks the ability to research catalogs, the ability to carry out linguistic analysis, and the ability to develop an, an applied linguistics and pedagogy or language teaching uh, approach. Uh, all of that in two weeks. So that's uh, a, a tremendous demand on these researchers and we're trying to figure out how to facilitate at least the part that we know how to do as curators and archivists and library uh, scientists. So um, in collaboration with the Miami, uh, Miami uh, University, we are taking the, this tool, MIDA, which is the Miami, Illinois Digital Archive developed by the Miami tribe, um, and apply it or make it available to um, Breath of Life participants. What this tool does is um, it allows you to upload digital sur surrogates, high quality archival TIFFs. Um, you're able to uh, code the type of document that it is, uh, transcribe the language uh, material, translate it, gloss it, do whatever level of analysis you need to do, and it also allows you to output uh, data from this analysis. So the Miami tribe is using it to develop a dictionary, which they don't yet have. Um, but when I learned about this tool, which was developed uh, through an NEH grant, I figured that we could tweak it um, to make it available to uh, any community that is ready, uh, that has the human resources and, and interest to do that kind of work on their own language. So we're planning to do a pilot this summer and during the Breath of Life uh, weeks to test it out. We'll work with one community that precisely had that experience. We were able to digitize everything on their language, uh, deliver it to them. We thought we were very proud, and then <laughs> they were very overwhelmed. So now we're going to see if uh, we're going to work through the materials with, sorry, with this tool and um, see how we can make it usable to, uh, within the Breath of Life context. Um, let me see, how am I doing on time? I think I can still spend a little bit of time on field research and uh, maybe I wanted to do this because that's um, something I really like to do. Um, so many of us are out in the field, uh, the three curators behind Recovering Voices have field sites um, that we've been working um, at for a very long time. We've, we have community relationships that go back 15, 20 years and we work, we have fellows and interns and collaborators that are out in the field uh, regularly. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about one project that I've been involved in for many, many years, uh, just to show you how collections-based research, how we conceive of collections-based research um, based on um, outside in the field. We're not just tied to the museum collections. Um, I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing to document the lexicon of Dijasa, which is a Zapotec language spoken in the south of Mexico. It's spoken about 70, by about 70,000 speakers, which sounds like a lot, uh, but in reality, um, of the 22 municipalities where the language is spoken, only one or two have kids that are learning the language. So at this point, in the community that I work the most, the youngest, the youngest speakers are in their late 20s already. Um, so, in devising a dictionary for this language, I came upon, uh, so this is a dictionary with well over 10,000 entries, now it's about 13,000. About 1,000 of those entries were related to plants, and I had crazy entries like the one I have here, where a tree would be called Yagalagitu, Yalagitu, Yagitu, so different names. 
um, they were they would give me different names in Spanish for the for this one name in Zapotec: Palo Mulato, Huachalala, Copal, Carnero, and the descriptions I had were all over the map. It's uh, you know plant, some of sometimes I would be told that it the tree exfoliates, sometimes it doesn't exfoliate, sometimes it has latex, sometimes it has sap, uh, sometimes it has medicinal uses, sometimes it doesn't. And, and that made me realize that the documentation I had collected, this was in 2010, was just not going to give me the, the documentation that it was, would be adequate for a dictionary. So because I was already at the Museum of Natural History, I started talking to botanists. I ran a pilot in 2012 to try to figure out how to conduct uh, botanical research, so, which is something I did not learn in linguistics school. <laughs> and uh, to make a long story short, we carried out a one-year uh, plant documentation project, interdisciplinary, um, looking at documenting the plants with two botanists uh, in the project, documenting knowledge with several knowledge bearers from the community, um, uh, taking audio, taking photographs by a professional photographer. And um, in the end, we ended up with a huge database, which we're tweaking even today. Um, we did 92 field collection sites, lots of numbers that I no, don't need to uh, bore you with. But we ended up with a collection, uh, a huge collection of uh, botanical samples like the one you can see there, housed at the National Museum of Natural History, at the National Herbarium in Mexico, and, th and two herbaria in Oaxaca, uh, in the state where the community is located. Um, and we have over 5,000 high quality, high resolution images of the plants. So with that, we were able to clean things up. And I learned that there's an entire, um, sort of the equivalent of a genus uh, of Yagalaguito trees. Uh, and indeed, they have very different properties because they're very different species. Um, they belong to different families, so they're going to look different and behave differently. Um, and now we have a clear understanding of why these trees, despite their very different properties, are all lumped into this one uh, category. And it's the architecture of the tree that brings them all together. We did not realize that. This is, these photos are from the very last day of one year of uh, being in the field. <laughs> so um, now, let me just go back here. Um, this is a collection that did not exist before. Botanists, when they go out to the field, they come back with hundreds of uh, plant samples, but the knowledge is not something they have the bandwidth to document. We were able to do that. We were able to also uh, create resources that are meaningful to the community, the audio, the photographs. The entire collection is uh, accessible online through the botany department's website, but also there's a dedicated website for the collection. Um, and we created educational materials for children, uh, for schools that are being disseminated uh, free of charge. Um, we, uh, we also developed a work workshops around the topics of language and environmental conservation for children, which have been running monthly for over two years. Um, we also had a community visit funded through the project. This was a project funded by the uh, Museum of Natural History. So you can see here um, the gentleman in the photo, in the bottom photo, it was our key knowledge bearer. He took us to the hills for uh, a full year. And at the top, there's another gentleman with his hands like this. He is a historian and writer uh, from the community who was here working with me to write definitions for the plants in Zapotec. So we wrote, we didn't translate, but wrote in tandem. I wrote in Spanish and, and English, and he wrote them, the descriptions in Zapotec. Um, so again, a very robust collections-based research that is collaborative, beneficial to the community, and that can be done in the field. So just to summarize, um, our research priorities, National Breath of Life is a top priority. The community research program, right now we're serving three communities. If we can serve six per year, we'll be very, very happy. Uh, and collaborative uh, field-based uh, research. 
We, of course, because of the type of, com of uh, institution that we are, we have a lot of dissemination and outreach, uh, a lot of outreach in communities. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the work on the plants led to workshops for children that keep going even two years after we finish the basic research. And we're constantly doing uh, public outreach at uh, the museum. Um, we, do, we organize events such as the Mother Tongue Film Festival, which will be taking place around the February 21st date, which is Mother Tongue Day, uh, observed internationally. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and that's it. Um, I probably did, well, no, 30 minutes. So I'm available for um, any questions. Um, the other day there was a film about the Wampanoag uh, yeah. recovery program. Right. Have they participated in any of these programs or is that yeah, so the question was whether the Wampanoag community has participated in any of our programs. They haven't. Um, but Jessie Little Doe Baird is, uh, of course, very, her background is very, and her contributions are very comparable to those of Daryl Baldwin. So uh, we follow her work closely because it informs uh, a great deal of what we're doing. Yes. You talk about a lot of it is obviously for all of us here speaking English or maybe Spanish or some other language where Mexico is important to have a, a bilingual dictionary of some sort. What type of historical tribes might have talked to other tribes and where one tribe would support another to try to keep that language alive? Or is, is there areas, I don't know, had some things on Chumash or Hopi and Navajo or, you know, are there groups within the, the Native Americans themselves trying to? So the question is whether across the tribes there's support and networking for the purpose of, purposes of language revitalization. The answer is yes. Um, so there's a couple of things. Again, I think that Daryl Baldwin's involvement in Breath of Life is very much an attempt to share the model that has worked so well for his tribe and his language uh, and put it to the service of other tribes that might be doing similar work. Uh, one tricky thing with re revitalization overall is that there's no one size fits all and what works with one community might totally bomb in another community. So um, Breath of Life is a very uh, effective way for the experience of people doing re revitalization and language reclamation, so when the cases where there are no longer speakers or the, the, the base of first language speakers was lost at some point, and share those experiences so that other practitioners of uh, revitalization can adapt those experiences to their own benefit. Um, National Breath of Life, actually one of the main objectives uh, of the program is to allow participants to become part of a growing network of revitalization practitioners. That's one of those things that are a little bit intangible, that we, it's, are difficult to measure. But we know that over time, all of these practitioners will be talking to each other and learning from each other. And in Breath of Life, we, have, we take participants with different backgrounds. We might have someone coming in who has been involved in the revitalization program for 20 years, and we might have someone who is just getting into it because now they have a baby and they want the baby to speak the language. Um, and every, every, you know, all the experiences in between. So they're able to talk to each other. We've had, we've observed conversations when someone will say, well, you know, I really want to have a school in my community. I don't know how to do it. I'm really overwhelmed. And that's a conversation at the beginning of the two weeks. And by the end of the two weeks, the conversation is, now I know what I need to tell my tribe. Now I know how to do it. Now I know people who have been doing it and who are willing to advise me. Um, so yeah, there's very much a lot of uh, communication and we try to foster that um, as well. Uh, add, add to that, uh, I think the question is a really interesting one, and maybe conceptually and ideologically, as Gabriel is saying, the models that people have done in terms of doing language revitalization are important for other communities who don't have language speakers to say, yes, we, yes, maybe we can do this ourselves in our own communities. But, you know, instrumentally, it's no particular 
reason for Chumash to be talking to Hope because they're not related and they're not linguistically at all. So um, in the film that we saw a couple weeks ago, I was really fascinated by the fact that the Wampanoag used the online dictionary by the Passamaquoddy because they're Algonquin you know, the linguistic families to borrow loan words and to like reconstruct their you know, kind of the language and the vocabulary. That would make sense, I would think. I mean, it's, it's, it's a far cry that I'm trying to figure out how those sort of uh, Yeah, there was, there was another question here. So you're asking whether, in a case like the Quechua, whether they would be able to benefit from some of these programs that we're running at Recovering Voices, or from Breath of Life specifically? Okay, so um, this is where the one size, uh, no one size fits all uh, comment comes into play. Um, there are actually one thing that we're doing in, in within Recovering Voices, which is a separate line of you know research, is to try to uh, document revitalization efforts around the world because we know a great deal about what's being done in the U.S. and Canada and Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii is the U.S., uh, but it, it's slightly different um, context. But we don't know much about what the situation is elsewhere, and yet there's a lot of revitalization happening around the world. Um, the idea with this research is to be able to kind of get a sense of how people respond to the, their needs and challenges in any revitalization process. Um, every community that has uh, that wants to do revitalization faces the issue of not having materials to uh, teach the language. And something that is very curious is that revitalization seems to have moved away from a natural transmission of the language from parent to child or caregiver to child to a language teaching practice. And the language teaching requires um, ancillary materials to support the work. Um, what my suggestion would be in that particular case, I mean, Quechua has a lot of support because there's been a lot of uh, linguistics, anthropology uh, research conducted on the various um, uh, languages. So it might just be a matter of looking, uh, actually locally, um, what other communities have developed in the way of resources um, and learn from those experiences. It's a long process, and sometimes when you think, well, it's really only the grandparents that are speaking the language and the kids need to learn it, and by the time we write the books, we might have lost many of these speakers. And so what um, might come handy in that case is the uh, master apprentice model, which is when um, an, a language speaker gets paired up uh, with a language learner, generally adults, but it could work with children as well, for the purposes of creating kind of a, an immersion uh, environment between these two people for the purposes of speaking the language and having the person learn the language, independently of whether there might be materials to support that process. And so this model specifically wants to go back to the natural transmission of uh, language and the development of an immersion uh, environment. So it sounds like maybe in this particular case there can be an effort to develop materials, but maybe a master apprentice type of model would work. Uh, one thing we did um, in La Ventosa for the Zapotec language where, um, that I've been working on for the dictionary and the plants documentation 
is that, I mean, I develop materials as part of the, pro uh, the project, but we also, uh, we were not going to write a grammar and a, you know, this and a that. So really the work is, the workshops are designed to uh, emphasize oral communication between these knowledge bearers and the children. And when you work with children, it works like this. I mean, you have to provide the child with sufficient input. They need to be able to get uh, o well over 20% of their day in Quechua in order for them to uh, have sufficient input for their brain to um, acquire the language and for the child to develop into a competent and especially, especially confident speaker. If they are not confident, they're not going to speak. So if there can be a combination of those elements, I think that based on what I, you just told me that maybe that can work. They work, yeah. Um, is there an audio or video component to the work? Yes. Um, audio has been critical for the longest time, and that's why, um, you know, projects like the, or documentation as far back as when wax cylinders were the medium um, has been critical. You can annotate as much as you want, but you lose a lot of detail if the uh, documenter that missed a slight uh, um, detail of the pronunciation, then you already have deficient documentation. So audio is really critical and, um, and the audio needs to be done, recorded at a very high quality. So yes, that's always an element. Um, we, in Breath of Life, we very much see the relevance of audio and actually one of the key reasons why uh, the partnership with the Library of Congress makes so much sense is that, um, you know, the, the um, wax cylinders were moved here uh, some time ago, and that's a tremendous um, resource for these communities. And just to give you an example, there are songs that are recorded um, that, for example, for me as a linguist, they don't seem very interesting because the vocabulary is limited, maybe the syntax will be fairly simple and limited, but the performance of the song opens an, a domain of use of the language, which ultimately is what um, these communities need to do in order to bring back active use of the language. So audio is critical. Now video has now become a much more accessible um, medium of uh, recording and it allows for everything else. I mean, I'm always, I always have my hands up in the air. Um, you know, the, the, the cultural elements that dictate the, the, your body language, your disposition, um, provide a great deal of information. Uh, I mentioned that the Wauja chiefs that came in September spent a fair amount of time at the film archives. There are films uh, produced in their community 50 years ago or so um, that they never saw. The, the, the filmmakers never went back to the communities to share that work with them. So they were able to see it and granted there's no audio to go with it. But there was so much cultural information in that video uh, that they were just ecstatic and we were able to give them copies of the video finally um, to take back. So long way to say yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you said you performed outreach to me. I remember previous slides in academic settings. How do you reach the people like the mother who has a child that wants to teach her or a native speaker who may be in a remote area? How do you do outreach to those? Sure. Well, I mean, again, Breath of Life is very much about outreach. It's, you know, a community member that I'm never going to know about because I'm working in the south of Mexico. But because we have this programmatic activity, we, you know, put out a call and, you know, people get to apply that otherwise we wouldn't be able to reach. So that it is very much about outreach. Um, now, um, the workshops that we designed for the community is entirely outreach so and and the materials so we developed um, as we 
curated with the, in collaboration with the knowledge bearers in La Ventosa, we curated a selection of plants that they felt were the most representative or the most important to know about uh, because we, we documented we, con we collected 1,300 botanical samples. Out of those, we documented 288 uh, Zapotec names. Uh, and so we brought that down to a selection of 54 Zapotec names that were the most important. And we produced, a, which I meant to bring, and I forgot this morning. I'm very sorry. But we produced these very big, um, sturdy books that are actually like fact cards so you can distribute them in the classroom and you know they can get beat up and so on and they'll um, they'll last um, with information in Zapotec first then Spanish um, it has all the botanical information the you know family uh, genus taxon um, so that they can th these materials can um, be appealing for the knowledge bearer without uh, scholarization to the natural sciences teacher in the academic environment and we can bring, bridge the cultural knowledge and, and the academic approaches um, for the purposes of learning about the local plants, learning about the names, also inviting people to read in Zapotec. Um, the, this community has had a, a writing system since the 50s, but very few people actually uh, read and write. So, you know, my colleague there in pink, he's one of the most prolific uh, writers ever in this uh, region, but there are very few like him. Um, so the orange booklets there are literacy manuals that we produced. That was the one kind of applied uh, linguistics um, item that we produced for the project to invite people to, uh, in a, an accessible manner, to start reading more in their language. So that's all. Uh, we also produce games which the child is uh, actually holding. Uh, it's like a bingo card with plants. So it's all outreach. Um, you have to be very strategic about how you do it. You need to make sure that the outreach happens independently of whether you're present there, and that's really not easy to do. Uh, but there's, you know, I, I think that's one of the um, the challenges that we've been that we're most happy about in terms of how we've been able to to meet that. So the same thing we can do here in the museum, we can do the whole same package, so to speak, in the field. Yes. Uh, in, in dealing with a language like Zapotec that I think maybe 20 years ago had 40 dialects or something, how do you deal with the dialects? Do you try to unify the language in some way in order to teach it? Okay, so amazing question. So the question is how do you deal with the rich dialectology of Zapotec languages? So. When the term Zapotec uh, actually refers to a family of languages as diverse as the Rom uh, Romance languages. So, uh, you know, someone who speaks Juchitan Zapotec from La Vintosa, like uh, this gentleman and the kid, uh, will not be able to understand the person who is from, you know, near the, the Central Valleys, near the capital city of the state. Um, different tonal systems, different pronominal systems, just like Spanish and Portuguese and Italian. Uh, so what do we do? Actually, the approach, and this is the approach of Zapotecanists and not necessarily the approach of recovering voices. Um, the approach by Zapotecanists is to document as many of these uh, language varieties as we possibly can so that we can understand the differences and so that we can understand whether, you know, ha we can make decisions about what materials to produce for each of these communities. And there's a, an army of linguists at this point in Oaxaca tending to uh, Zapotec languages and many other languages. Mystic languages have the same level of dialectal diversity. Uh, but it's, you know, the materials that I produce for um, Isma Zapotec can be used across 22 communities because the dialectal differences there are, do not impede mutual intelligibility. But it is very much the case that from one town to the next, the tonal system will be different. Um, so it's, it's a huge challenge. You really need a lot of customization um, uh, for, for a situation as diverse as that. Yes? Anybody who has great material 
Um, so the question is, can existing materials from one language or one community be used for another language and another community? That's very much the case, yes. And I would say that um, definitely reclamation um, efforts in the U.S. are very much based on that level of exchange. And Guha was mentioning the Wampanoag using the dictionary of the uh, developed by the Passamaquoddy because they had uh, documented uh, words that the, that the Wampanoag no longer had access to. Similarly, for um, the Miami language, they looked at Miami, they looked at Peoria, and they looked at other um, related languages uh, in a similar way. Um, the Otoya Missouri, they're always looking at all of the Suan languages. Well, not all of them, but a, 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 a set of uh, closely related Suan languages because they can draw from. And then they also share the materials and the approaches. Um, so, you know, again, there is no one size that fits all the situations, but the exchange and taking a little bit of here and applying it there, uh, that's really how the communities develop their their approaches, um, and, and it's a massive effort. Um, and I don't know, when I started studying linguistics a re really long time ago, um, things looked pretty grim, and they don't look grim anymore. It's amazing how many people are so incredibly devoted to uh, restoring their uh, cultural knowledge, restoring their languages, that it's really encouraging. Yes? years ago there was a National Geographic uh, article on endangered languages mm. and some of the pictures and, and publication examples where people, two speakers left or eight speakers left. Yeah. What is done and you know, can be done in a situation like that and, and is it some kind of emergency thing that is tried to put support or, or infrastructure towards something like that or is that very difficult to even attempt to keep something to resuscitate? Well, so the question is, can community, language communities with just a couple of speakers left, uh, do they, what resources or recourses, uh, recourse they have? Um, Breath of Life is very much geared towards assisting those communities. Um, also, our community research program has already worked with the Shmuich, Barbarino Chumash in California, um, and with the Kiksch language um, out of the uh, Warm Springs Confederated, Confederated Tribes of Oregon. Um, and the Chumash no longer have first language speakers, so they're rebuilding a speaker base. Uh, for Kiksch, um, actually, Kiksch, they don't have first language speakers anymore. Uh, but the process is the same. They come here, they look at the materials, they go back. There's always someone in the community or a group of people in the community who are dedicated to learning the language and becoming second language speakers. Um, and you know, the master apprentice program is a model that is often implemented when you have just a couple of speakers. You have a couple of speakers and you know, someone pairs up with one of them and now you have an exchange of lang linguistic knowledge and um, you know, people who can uh, hold on to that knowledge even if these two uh, last speakers uh, pass away. I mean, it's a less than ideal situation. But Breath of Life um, is precisely named Breath of Life because it's so heavily focused on those kinds of situations. Yes? Um, can you talk about the Zapotec diaspora community and any interactions you've had with them? Yes. I, so the question is what... Um, what interaction have I had with the diaspora community in, uh, of Chiavini in Los Angeles? Uh, I dedicated my dissertation to the study of the diaspora community and the relationship between them and the home community and how that affected language vitality. Um, and I carried out a couple of extra field research trips to the LA area after my dissertation. Uh, much to my regret, it's some. It's one. It's a one project that has fallen beyond my bandwidth, um, and it's not something I've been able to follow up with. Um, at some point, so I've done it in a number of ways. I've, I've maintained my contact in a number of ways. So, for example, the young woman in checkered shirt 
kind of on, on your right of the photograph. She is a member of the Chiavini community in the Los Angeles area. She is one of very, very few people in the community, whether in the U.S. or in Chiavini, uh, that have gotten a, an undergraduate degree. She got it in uh, biology. And when I met her during one of my field research um, visits to LA, she told me that she was interested in um, cultural elements, rec recovery of cultural knowledge, considering in the diasporic context. Um, and you know, one thing led to another. And when I put together this project, I told her, listen, this is an example of how you can bring your, botany, your biology background and your interest in culture and, and do something very meaningful for many different stakeholders. And so I was able to fund uh, a trip for her to come to the project uh, from LA. So it's not something I've been able to follow up on. But for example, I have it in my radar maybe a year from now to do, to replicate this project in three or four other communities, uh, Zapotec communities in uh, Mexico. And it's in my radar to keep track of this young woman because her, the community, Chiavini, is one of the places where I would want to do the research and she could be the person leading that effort. So um, again, it's not something that's gonna happen like this. But yes, there's always a way to, you know, uh, pull them in. Yes. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that during the, uh, the Breath of Life uh, the workshops, the two week long workshops that you have, um, uh, people uh, with backgrounds in linguistics uh, working with these speakers, do they typically also have experience with the language? Phase? Yes, absolutely. They have to. Um, sometimes we have invited um, linguists who don't have, whose research is not in that language family, but on the condition that they need to get up to speed on the literature and so on. So yes, absolutely, that, that is a critical uh, element of the selection of the um, linguists. And the linguists go through a competitive process too. This year, God, I mean, we're gonna need 15 linguists and we got about 35 applications. So it's just as competitive on that side. Uh, which is great. Because I've, I've worked with Del Monte in languages before. Mm -hmm. sure yeah, like I, I wouldn't be able to help uh, someone working on an Algonquian language. Right. Um, but there, will, there might be, I'm hoping, uh, there might be a Zapotec uh, researcher coming this year. Uh, she happens to be at UMass Amherst, and we happen to have a huge collection of untapped materials from Yalalag, which is her town. Um, so all of us, and be, you know, she speaks English, and so she can be part of this. So hopefully, it'll work out. Uh, <laughs> another uh, kind of another question. Uh, uh, I've been living in uh, the country of Georgia for the past year, and we have uh, minorities called uh, or minority languages of Mekwe and Swan, mm -hmm. which are related to Georgian the same language family. Um, but uh, and, and while while I've been there. I didn't studying those languages myself, and uh, of course they're all, both of them are kind of in dire situations. Mm -hmm. How does a country as small as Georgia, um, with attitudes that, that are kind of, um, oh, what can we do, we can't do anything about this town, mm -hmm. um, I guess. How do you turn around? So the question is, uh, how do you turn around over, you know, attitudes that are, yeah, of apathy or, or um, what's the word? Um, yes, indifference or helplessness. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, a, a big uh, issue. And, and also, you know, there's other things, a lot of discrimination involved and so on. Um, uh, so, Language attitudes really is, is a critical factor. I mean, it's after all, it's language attitudes and similar types of displays of tolerance or intolerance that uh, have driven these languages to the state of affairs that we have now. Um, changing them, as we know, social change is very long, it's a very long-term project. Um, and so, I think 
so awareness raising is really important. Raising awareness about the value of diversity because we've been taught since the 1800s when nations were being built around the model of one nation, one language, that that's the only way to sustain uh, you know, the unity of a nation. Um, and, you know, and, and, with, and with that comes a lot of educational practices grounded on the notion that uh, people, the children can only learn one language and if they learn two or more, they'll be delayed, they'll go crazy, et cetera. So now we're in a different situation where we have research-backed um, data to show that a child not only can learn more than a language, but that the child will develop um, certain abilities beyond the levels that a monolingual child will be able to develop them. And these are abilities like executive function, the ability to focus on one thing despite the fact that you might have a lot of uh, stimuli around you. That is much more developed in a bilingual child than in a monolingual child. So we can start pushing that out. And I think linguists are doing a decent job in doing that. It's just that there, um, perhaps there isn't a very good centralized way to do it, although the UNESCO has been trying to do so. That's why the Mother Tongue International Day uh, exists, to just raise awareness internationally about the fact that there are 7,000 languages, they all are important for a reason or another, and the reasons go the spectrum of human rights to it's critical for the advancements of science. Um, and, you know, so again, I, I think that there are a lot of movements perhaps not as widespread as we would want them. Um, and certainly, revitalization cannot wait for all of these changes to happen. They actually have to happen at the same time. And for example, within the linguistics discipline, seeing communities engage with their, the revitalization of their languages just has pulled the, the entire discipline along. And there's still people who are armchair linguists who are not gonna get involved. But an entire generation of linguists has emerged that is dedicated to documenting these languages and working in a collaborative way uh, with these communities. So again, I think these are all things that are gonna have to happen at the same time. Um, I mean, just to give us an example, in Mexico, 10 years ago, I mean, the last 10 years have been critical. That Mexico has very progressive legislation in, in support of indigenous languages. The practice is a whole other issue. But because that legislation exists, a uh, a, an organization that is a law-based, a legal um, consultancy, non-for-profit legal consultancy grounded on the uh, observance of linguistic rights has emerged in Oaxaca that has entirely transformed the, the scene in Oaxaca. They work with judges to uh, d um, educate them and so on and so forth. I mean, it's work that is very removed from what we're doing in Recovering Voices because uh, we can't do it all and we're not going to go and save the world. But it, everybody is having to do you know, what they know how to do and, and put, apply it to uh, supporting the same goal. Any other question? Oh, I, I just have a general question. How, may, how strong is the collection in the Smithsonian? Let's say there are X languages lost or endangered uh, in the United States. How many of these languages can you support? Yeah, good, very good question. So the question is how many languages can we support uh, with the collections that we have at the um, National Anthropological Archives? We can very safely say that we probably have something from every single language that has been spoken in the United States since the 1800s. Um, how much do we have is a different question. Uh, we have very vast collections of Algonquian languages, for example. Um, we, there's a language that was spoken in California that no longer has speakers and that was very poorly documented. Uh, the language is Esalen. And in 2011, we hosted a researcher from the Esalen community 
And at first, when I saw what we had, I was like, well, it's not a lot. I don't think that she's going to be able to do much with this material. But then I learned about the situation, and this person was actually scouting the world for documentation on Nesselin, which meant that her coming to see these materials, and this was before we had a more robust digitization element um, as we do now, but it made a lot of sense for her to come, even though these were not massive, uh, this was not a massive collection. But the other thing is that that's why we partner with the Library of Congress and with NMAI, because sometimes we might have a little bit and they have a ton. So, yeah. So right now, we're precisely right now, we're in the process of looking at the collection. So we've already done our survey based on the 65 or 70 people who applied. We've already looked at our uh, collections to determine what's what we have. Um, and there were a few cases where I noted that we didn't have a very robust collection. And so now our program assistant uh, is going to look at what these languages, what Library of Congress and MMAI have for these languages, because then that might change the picture entirely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing is exchanging resources and making all of these resources, not just the NAA, but the resources in the three institutions available. Well, thank you for the great questions. <laughs> so thank you so much, Gabriela. That was uh, an amazing presentation. Thank you all for coming. And uh, from the perspective of the Library of Congress, we're very uh, happy and uh, glad to be part of this enterprise that you have uh, uh, embarked on. And uh, we look forward to more work with you and you. give us some food for thought here as to how our collections might best serve the, you know, this enterprise uh, that we're all in together. So thanks again. Appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.